Good morning and welcome to the meeting place at the Mennonite Church of Normal. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we welcome you and we are glad you're here. We had a lovely time at Menohaven Camp and Retreat Center last Sunday. The weather was beautiful. We experienced nurturing worship, fabulous food, and fun activities. I enjoyed observing a great blue heron up close from a canoe, and I think someone caught the biggest fish of the day, their very first time fishing. If you weren't able to be there, talk to someone who was and make plans to go next year. And also, don't miss the Nature Slideshow, uh, which was part of the worship service last week. There was a link to it in the midweek. Um, I think it demonstrates how many um, outdoorsy, gardeny people we have in our congregation. Um, so that was really fun. Um, a few announcements uh, before we begin our worship this morning. Um, during Christian Education Hour today, everyone is invited to enjoy an ice cream social to celebrate this back to school, back to Sunday school, back to routine time. Um, and Holly will have further announcements about that at the end of the service. Uh, next Sunday, there is another opportunity for ice cream, homemade this time at Daryl and Lynette Miller's home. Uh, this is part of the Hosting in Homes initiative. So that'll be next Sunday, uh, August 27th at 5 p.m. And slots are limited. So please RSVP to Lynette or the church office by Wednesday of this week if you would like to be there. For uh, updates on the MCC School Kit Project and the MCC Comforter Bash, which is coming up in September, uh, September 15 and 16, please see the midweek. And finally, we offer our sincere condolences to Ron Ropp on the death of his wife and life partner, Joe. Ron, we are sorry for your loss and hope we can be a support to you in this time of grief, the way you have supported so many others. Visitation will be today at the church from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., and the funeral will be tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m., with a burial following at the Rop Cemetery. I see a couple people who are here who have not been here for a long time. Are there other guests um, who would like to be introduced? Up and I, we have a friend visiting with us, and she's visiting her friends in the community. She's lived here before, Cheryl Rempel from Minnesota. So she was a part of this church and considers her still, considers herself still part of it. Okay, well, welcome to our worship this morning. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one other announcement. Um, there will be no child or youth CE next Sunday, but there will be an MYF cafe hosted by the Chups at the church building during the CE time, and JMYF are invited to attend that as well. Um, finally, one last little thing. The opening prayer this morning is adapted from the writings of Bernard of Clairvaux. He's a 12th century sister. Cistercian monk who died on this day in 1153. He is credited with the text of the familiar hymn, Jesus, the very thought of thee. So you may hear echoes of this hymn in the prayer. And now we have a ministry moment by the uh, MYF who went to convention this summer. Good morning. I'm Shelley King. Um, yes, we, MYF wanted to come up and share a little bit about their experience at Kansas City Convention in July. Um, they, we kind of wanted to say that as a thank you to the church for supporting and making this possible. 
also to let you know why it was worthwhile to support it, because it really, really was. And I just wanted to add a little side note while I'm doing that. Um, the, I'm going to kind of speak on behalf of the adults that went, which was my husband, Darvis, and me as sponsors. And we also had our oldest son, Jonah, as an assistant because Darvis had just had surgery. And we were really glad that Jonah was along with us, too. Um, but we, as the adults, really found joy in this week spending with this group of youth. It was fantastic. Lexi Neely's not here, but the five of them um, was a blessing to spend that time. They are a fabulous group that you should get to know if you haven't. And also there's other youth that weren't able to go. And I can tell you from experience, they are also so worth knowing. So I wanted to put that plug in because Darvis and I are junior high youth group sponsors. So there is no sponsors at this point for the high school youth. Um, if anybody chose to do that, you would be very blessed by it. But even if you can't, don't want to commit to that, the discipling committee would welcome, host, if you would host one event with them, you would, it would be really worth your time to spend that time with them, like after church lunch, a pizza game night, anything, ice cream party, whatever you'd want to do, I really recommend getting to know them because they are fantastic. We're going to show you a little bit about what we did that week, and everybody's going to take some turns telling you a little bit, too, about their highlights. So there's our group. I'll tell you real quick in case you don't know. So Lexi Neely is first. She's in Ireland now, so she couldn't be with us, but she sent some of her highlights. And then me, and that's our oldest, Jonah, Jordan King, Emma King, that's Darvis, Ian Unsicker, and Jaren Zare. So they were the ones that attended. We took a little van. To oh, no. No, oh, no, not a little van. It was a large van to Kansas City. Um, and we checked into our Marriott Hotel. There we are. I'm so happy. And did our first worship that night. There were many worships throughout the week. Um, and a nice, and that was with the adults and with children and with all the crowd. So that was a lot of fun. And I really appreciated the time we'd have after worship to gather back together and talk about it and hear what they thought about things. And then there were lots of things that were planned in between worship and seminars. So Jordan's going to share one of those real quick. Uh, one thing that I really liked was like the tables and the booths throughout the hallways that had like displays from colleges and other organizations. There were like a lot of fun games that you could play for prizes or you could enter like drawings for different items. So I got lucky and I, I won three, three drawings for a sweatshirt and two other shirts. But even if you don't win, it's still fun because you can just learn about all the different Mennonite places and you can still get free things. <laughs> Jaren, Sure. Um, a reason it's worth it to go there are so many seminars to choose from that you can experience, which are led by professors of Mennonite universities. As a senior in high school, it was really cool to check out the college opportunities and also kind of step into what a lecture might look like. Um, not to say that these were at all boring because the topics were absolutely riveting. Uh, something I got out of it, I really enjoyed debriefing with the rest of the youth group after seminars so we could talk about how to apply the ideas to our own church community. Um, we had attended uh, two out of the three talks um, and were really transformed by them. Yeah. What's your next one? Sorry. Sorry, you guys will be walking back and forth. Um, one of the seminars that I thought was really good was the one about fast fashion. And I really liked how the speaker who was doing the lecture, they didn't like put guilt on us for what we buy and like, whether it was good for the environment, but they instead helped us to like figure out what we value and like we could take in, like help us take smaller steps so that we can make better decisions in what we buy and where we, we find where it comes from. And I will add that Lexi sent. Um, for me, I think that it was worth it to go to convention specifically because it was just meaningful to be in the same room as all those people who are all coming together to learn and like to be a community together. And then I also think as a youth member, it was really fun to meet other youth. Um, I'm speaking about like getting to know youth. Another thing I thought was really fun was the rec center. And it was just great, a great place to play a bunch of different games and learn new games. And then you could also meet a bunch of other youth from other churches around the country. 
there were bigger games of like Gaga Ball and Foursquare that we, you were able to like talk to people in the line or like while you're playing and just get to know other people at Menocon. So just overall, Menocon was just so much fun and I hope that everyone else gets to experience it. And so I'm just gonna show you, we had some great games too. We had a, rou a rousing game of Extreme Spoons, which I think hopefully the video will work. <laughs> So they're looking for spoons in the ball pit, and it started with everybody, and it was, we were committed to getting all the balls back, but it was wild for a while. Now, they took about six or seven school buses to Worlds of Fun, Oceans of Fun, and lots of, lots of people went, so that was another opportunity to interact with other youth as well, and lots of fun. I do have a video from that, too. I didn't have a video of this one, but I know that Jaron was very vocal on this one as well. <laughs> but we have a little video. Many of them went on this ride. <laughs> <clears throat> we also went out for fireworks one night, and uh, you'll see on there, too, Lexi's uncle joined us. He lives in Kansas City, so that was, that was a fun night to get out a little bit. And let's see. Oh, a popular thing was the scooters outside of the hotel, so we see Jaron and Ian on that. And then Ian had another highlight from that week. <clears throat> one highlight for me was playing cards in the hotel lobby and playing games in the rec, like Jordan said. Um, and then also we happened to make a really funny connection, uh, which just kind of shows how cool the community is. So some of Evan, my brother's campers from the previous week um, at Drift Creek all the way in Oregon were at convention. And their youth group just happened to be the one youth group that came down and played Una with us in the lobby. And then we, when we started talking, we found out that, that Evan was their counselor. And then they continued to say how much they loved him and how, he, how fun he was. It was just a really fun connection to make. One of the highlights for me was uh, food, imagine that. Um, I felt like the convention center did a really nice job um, providing our lunches, and then usually at uh, the evening time we would go out and have a meal together. And um, so, you know, Kansas City is supposed to be known for barbecue, but we had several vegetarians, so we did hit up a vegan restaurant. So that, that was, yeah, right there. So that was kind of a fun experience for all of us. Maybe not the most satisfying sometimes, but it was still a fun, a fun experience. And I, I really think the meal time uh, at lunch oh, and at dinner, it was a great time for us to kind of debrief and kind of figure out some things together as a group. And it was, it was definitely a cool time. Uh, my favorite restaurant we went, we went to was this taco place where Kim Shog was there just coincidentally at the same time. Totally random. He surprised us. That was fun. Okay, and so we definitely loved the worship time, too. And so here's us sitting at worship time. They had some great speakers. We heard some different speakers throughout. And we have Emma. Um, my highlight of convention or of the seminars was the service where we viewed a panel that represented multiple generations within different churches. And then they discussed different topics within their church and about the Mennonite community as a whole. And I just found it very interesting to listen to, and I'd be curious to see the different perspectives present in our own church. And that was another one that Lexi Neely mentioned, too. I think that we all kind of appreciated this multi-generational multi input that was very interesting for us to talk about later. They had some drama at those, too. And then, of course, we loved the music. So I have a little bit of video for that. So we'll be teaching that song to the little ones and everybody later in the service. But I'm going to let the, some of the youth finish up. This will be Ian, absolutely, Jaron and Ian and then Emma.
Um, if you contributed to convention or have attended convention in the past, did anything to support our trip, um, would you please stand and be recognized? Yay. Thank you guys so, so much. Our meals were fantastic. So thank you for paying the bill on that. So I think it's worth going to convention because you get to spend time with your youth group and get to know them better and make a lot of fun memories that you'll uh, remember for a long time. And then I'm very glad that I went to convention because I just really enjoyed the environment and the music is very, very good. And I think if anyone, especially youth, is debating going in the future, you absolutely should and you won't regret it. But if you do, you can blame me. <laughs> Thank you. Friends, beloved people of God, welcome to worship. I don't know your circumstances today. Do you come to worship this morning rested, peaceful, eager to worship God? Or do you come weary and needy, hungry for even a glimpse of God? Do you come from a busy life, scattered and distracted, a bit unsettled, God knows your circumstances. No matter how you come, my prayer is that you would meet God here today, that your heart, your mind, your body would be drawn to worship our great and marvelous God. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come with thanksgiving, bringing songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. 
Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. Let us worship together in song. Our first hymn is Voices Together, number 764, Oh for a Thousand Tongues, number 764. And let's join in singing hymn number 175, Planets Humming As They Wander. This is one that I think is probably new to, so Elsa's going to play through it. And then I saw people smiling about something. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll, we'll begin singing it.
Will you pray with me? Jesus, how sweet is the very thought of you. You fill our hearts with joy. The sweetness of your love surpasses the sweetness of honey. Nothing sweeter than you can be described. No words can express the joy of your love. Only those who have tasted your love for themselves can comprehend it. In your love, you listen to all our prayers. Even when our wishes are childish, our words confused, and our thoughts foolish. In your love, you answer our prayers, not according to our own misdirected desires, which, if fulfilled, would only bring us bitter misery, but according to our true needs, which, when received, bring sweet joy. Thank you, Jesus, for giving each of us the gift of yourself. Amen. Children, you may come forward for children's time and with your noisy offering. And if you remembered your backpacks, you can bring them up to... happy to see each one of you. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And if you're joining us online, I am also thankful for you that you're with us today to hear about our time together. Can you raise your hand if you have gone this past week have gone or next week are going to go back to school or back to daycare? Any of you in that boat? Yeah, and there's some folks out there who are in that boat too. So today, we want to do something really special for you so that as you're going back to daycare or back to school, you remember how much your church family loves you and how much we're thinking of you. And one of the things about going back to school is for some kids, it can feel really exciting and excitement can be a big feeling. And for some kids, it could feel really scary, okay? So if it felt really exciting, if the idea of going back to school or daycare is really exciting for you, will you pat your head? And if the idea of going back to school feels a little scary for you, could you rub your belly? And if it feels both, can you do both? And if you can do both of those things, I know you're going to do just great in school. So you can put your hands back in your lap. I wonder if you guys have heard this song before. It's a really old song, so you might not have heard it. It goes like this. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. I have never seen a sheep with fleece as white as snow, but I think it's because it rhymes. That's why she, she chose that. Now, the next part of it goes. It Followed her to school one day, school one day, school one day. It followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. And I wanted you to hear that song because it talks about a sheep going to school. And one of the things in the Bible that Jesus says about us is that we are like sheep. God says, that we are like God's sheep. And we're going to school too, but it's not against the rules. We got to go, okay? But there's a special psalm in the Bible that says, the Lord is my shepherd. So if we are sheep, the Lord is our shepherd. And I'm going to show you a story. For copyright reasons, I'm only showing the kids down here. It's Psalm 23 by Tim Laddig. And the pictures are so beautiful. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. And you see that grandma helping our kiddos get ready in the morning? I shall not be in want. 
and all around the breakfast table before school. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Look at them rolling in the grass at the park. He leads me beside quiet waters. There's a little puddle that they can play in on their way to school. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, they're following their teacher in a line, just like you might have to do at daycare at school. <clears throat> Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that means when I feel scared, like when you rubbed your belly, I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Look at this. Do you see the crossing guard? Yeah. Yeah. You prepare a table before me, like snacks after school, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, like bath time. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in your house forever. And there's a picture of Jesus looking down over the kids. That is, the Lord is my shepherd. And we want you to remember that when you go to school, the Lord is your shepherd too. So we have these backpack tags for your backpacks. And I want to give you a blessing for your backpack and your backpack tag. The front side says, you got this, but you don't got this all by yourself. You got this with love and prayers from your church family at Mennonite Church of Normal. So the front side says, you got this, but so that you remember you're not alone and the Lord is your shepherd. On the backside, it says, with love and prayers from your church family at Mennonite Church of Normal. And I'm going to hand these to you. And I also want to say your name and give you a blessing. When I give you your backpack and I share your blessing with you, then I want you to go right back to your seat and, and, um, and wait here. Okay, ready? So Ada, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Uh, and you, you're going to stay right there. Yep. Junia. Hey, Junia, look at me. Can you look me in the eyes? The Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Emery, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Peyton, the Lord is your shepherd. Can you look me in the eye? May you be blessed. There you go. Kyria, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Aiden, Ian, <laughs> the Lord is your shepherd, Ian. May you be blessed. Olivia, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Hayden, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Ezra, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Avery, the Lord is your shepherd. Oops, I got to make sure I get it right. Marjorie, yay, Marjorie, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Manuela, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed, Evelyn. The Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Most on here, Sam. Okay. Tana, uh, Tiana, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Ruby, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Elena, Elena? Anna, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Jamie, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Kiddos, will you stand up now? And face the moms and dads out there. Some of these grown-ups are also going back to school. Will you raise up your hands and say with me, dear ones, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. Here we go. One, two, three. Dear ones, the Lord is your shepherd. May you be blessed. And you can have a seat now. Miss Shelley is going to come and teach us a song. Yep, yep. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, there will be extra backpack tags in the library if you would like one for your laptop or computer, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hey, hi guys. Uh, we're going to sing a song, and we wanted your help because we know you guys know how to have joy with music. We had a song that we sang when the youth were at convention. 
We also would like, we're going to have the grown-ups too stand up in a second, but first I want to show you how we, how we move our hands for this song. And then we're going to get up and also show grown-ups how we can actually, when we feel joy, we can move a little bit too, because it's a really fun song to sing. Sorry, I'm all tangled here. All right, so the actions for this song, there's a part in the song that says, yes. So you put our thumbs up, we're going to put them up high. Yes, Lord. So it's L's. Can you make L's? There you go. That's, that's the main part of it. We'll do yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And then this is a little tricky. We go yes, yes, Lord. Let's try it again. We go yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Lord, we'll do that a few more times. And then at the end we go, amen. Can you do that with me? Amen. We'll do it a lot of times so you'll get good at it. And then there's some parts in the middle. Wesley and Jonah are going to be leading the music part so we can sing along together. But I'm going to have everybody stand up so we can all have some joy and use our actions. I think we're ready.
Great. Our first scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Maybe I should let it pull up first. There it is. And our second scripture comes from Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Well, thank you, Jonah, for reading Jonah for us. I'm a dad. I'm allowed to make such jokes. Let's pray together. God, as we look to Scripture, show us yourself. Teach us about your love. Help us to see ourselves as well. Teach us to... Give ourselves the grace that you give us when we don't like what we see. God, help us always to keep from shying away from the hard task of embodying your love. Amen. Well, the internet, as you all know, is a strange place. I recently came across an interesting factoid about the effectiveness of using a trampoline for exercise, how it is surprisingly effective for cardiovascular exercise. It also benefits the lymphatic system, according to this source. And apparently this is something that was studied and confirmed by NASA. In the comment section on this, uh, which you may well know I shouldn't have looked at, It wasn't long before someone chimed in with their frustration about NASA and their reluctance to return to the moon. And that was followed up by a real doozy. Someone responded, we never went to space, period. (laughs) They referenced some obscure documentary to support this, followed by the claim, if you're a Christian, definitely dig deeper, hashtag firmament. Now, before we get too far, I think it's helpful to practice some generosity and empathy. This person is clearly doing what they, the the best of their ability to make sense of the crazy world that we live in. Uh, They're clinging to things that they believe matter, and uh, they're rejecting science and basic observation because they think that God is telling them something else through the Bible. But this firmament thing, what is that all about? In the creation narrative, it talks about 
a vault or expanse or a firmament. The ancient understanding was that there was kind of a dome over the earth that held up the water in the sky, like literally a hard surface in the sky. So it kept the world from flooding all the time. The Hebrew word rakia has been translated expanse or firmament or dome. Uh, Biblical writers thought it was the area where God hung out. God was up above managing these waters. And when it comes to the flood narrative in Genesis, it talks about water literally coming through the floodgates of the heavens or literally the lattice windows of heaven. And in this kind of ancient understanding of how the world was constructed, there were all kinds of levels. There were the heavenly realms and the earthly realms. In the heavenly realms, there's the highest heaven. That's where God is, kind of where the angels are as well. There's the water that's above the skies, above this firmament that we're talking about. Uh, The sun and the moon and the stars are all trapped in this area. And uh, the atmosphere where the weather and the birds kind of live. And then there's the earthly realms of land and sea. And then below the land and sea is the waters under the earth. And then whatever sea creatures live down there. And then finally, the lowest point in the earthly realms, Sheol, the underworld. This is where the dead live in that perspective. Now, Jonah, after running away from God, God's call specifically to go to Nineveh, he's kind of on this downward trajectory. It says, Jonah set off to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. And it continues, he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went down to the ship. Going on, it says, while everyone was trying to survive the storm, it says Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. And then it says, the men throw Jonah down into the sea. Then Jonah is swallowed down into the belly of the fish. And Jonah feels this constant pulling downward. And so we see in Jonah 2, he says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, the lowest place you could go. And you heard my voice. He says, the waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me. And I went down to the land where whose bar is closed upon me forever, and yet you brought me up out of the pit. So Jonah descends as far as he can go, his own understanding of the world and everything above and below it. And yet this fish that God provides protects him and then starts an upward direction. He vomits him up onto dry land. So we expect now, after all of this crazy journey that he would be a changed man. We expect a new earnestness and eagerness to follow God's calling. And he does go to Nineveh, and the response is surprising. People take him seriously. People put on sackcloth and sit in ashes. The king declares a fast for all of the people in the land and all of the animals as well, and says, all shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And sure enough, as the people of Nineveh repent, God repents as well. As we read, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said would be brought upon them and did not do it. Good news, right? It's good news for the people of Nineveh. But Jonah, as we well know, is not happy about this. His response is to say, oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from punishment. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So incredibly dramatic response. He goes and sulks outside the city, 
And God, God grows a bush to give him some shade. And then the next day it says God appointed a worm to attack the bush so that it withered. And Jonah is exposed to the elements again and asks to die again. God reveals that in this little strange scenario, it's been kind of a microcosm for what God is up to in this whole story. God says, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished at night. And I should not be con- and should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. Jonah, in this scenario, in this kind of parable that has been embodied for him, is the worm. Appointed by God to do this thing, to reveal the full reality of the situation to these people so that they would change. In the sidebar here, ironically, this worm doesn't go into the belly of the fish in order to finally decide to become obedient Jonah was the one that became fish food. But why was Jonah so unwilling? It seems pretty strange outside of the context. And why was he so disappointed at the outcome? It worked. What God wanted to do, God was able to do. Why did it take him going all the way down to Sheol, this underworld, as he would have called it, to call out for help and finally give in to his God-given appointment to give God's message to the Ninevites. Roger Nam, who's an Old Testament scholar, he was one of my professors when I started seminary. Uh, He shared some helpful insight into why Jonah might feel this way, uh, giving some uh, modern kind of uh, observable impact. He says, if you visit the British Museum, you can see spectacular wall reliefs depicting Assyrian sieges. The famous siege of Lachish shows multiple images of Judeans being impaled, stacks of Judeans' heads, yes, disembodied heads that were counted by Assyrian scribes, presumably for a pay-per-head policy with the soldiers. Archaeologists discovered this relief in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. So here we are in Nineveh, the place that uh, Jonah doesn't want to go. There's clearly a long and uh, blood-stained history between the Hebrew people, as Jonah identifies himself, and uh, and these Ninevites. Nineveh, present-day Iraq, is the capital of this Assyrian empire. The Assyrians, as we know, destroyed Israel in 722 B.C., So Jonah isn't just kind of reluctant to be a prophet or missionary or whatever this is. He's afraid of this probably dangerous assignment. One scholar described that it would be like sending a Jewish speaker to deliver moral exhortation to the Germans in Berlin in 1936. So naturally, Jonah decides to go to Tarshish instead, which is somewhere around modern-day Spain or Turkey, so the opposite direction. I don't blame Jonah, and I completely understand this. The fact that he eventually gives God's message to the Ninevites and they respond with repentance is even more unbelievable than Jonah's three-night stay in the Airbnb inside a fish. So what is this story all about? I think it all comes down to what Jonah couches as a complaint against God. You are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. This, we know if we look carefully, is a direct quote from Exodus 34, verse 6. In Exodus, shortly after Israel makes the silly mistake of making a golden calf, God speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai to to renew the covenant and to make some new stone tablets for them. And God speaks to Moses 
and proclaims this about God's self. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We see these words coming up again and again throughout Scripture. In Exodus, they show God's willingness to put up with these people that are hard to please, always crying out and often deciding to ignore God's instructions uh, very deliberately and to make idols. And in Numbers 14, uh, shortly after the passage we read last week at Menohaven, Israel has rebelled against God and complained, asking to return to Egypt to be slaves again. God angrily responds, talking about pestilence and disheritance and all kinds of terrible things that lie ahead. But Moses quotes God's words back to God. It's a bold move. Moses says, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And so God forgives the people of Israel. But here in Jonah, these words are an accusation against God. Basically, Jonah is saying, why did you have to be this gracious and loving to those people? It seems that the center of this book is those Exodus words that Jonah quotes, and we can't repeat them enough. You are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Now, as we have already seen, this passage show, or this, uh, these words show up in Exodus and Numbers. We also see them in Joel 2.13, Nehemiah 9.17, Psalm 86.15, Psalm 103.8, Psalm 145.8, Nahum 1.3, uh, 2 Chronicles 39. So this concept is a central concept in the Old Testament. Alongside all kinds of other complicated narratives and images of God, we see that the center of who God is, is this gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Some scholars think that Jonah's a midrash of this verse from Exodus 34. In other words, they kind of think this whole story was perhaps written to illustrate that point and to help people to adopt this image of God. And what does this description of God do to us? How does this image of God feel to us when, like Jonah, we face our enemies? Now, it's a dangerous thing to name a common enemy. I'm not going to try to claim a common enemy for all of us, but let's put on someone else's story for a minute. I think we can find a parallel in the story of uh, someone else. The writer of Jonah came up with, came, uh, up with the first worst enemy that they could come up with, uh, and so we have to ask, who might that be for someone How do you find this super enemy? This story I want us to try on, uh, I encountered in a New Yorker uh, published documentary called Stranger at the Gate, a veteran's return from the brink of terrorism. And I highly recommend it. It's about 30 minutes long and uh, profound. In this documentary, you meet a man named Mac McKinney. And Mac spent 25 years in the Marines until he was discharged for injury. And in his description, he was an entirely different person when he came back, seeing all kinds of combat in different places over those 25 years. It had changed him. And he was dealing, as he realizes in hindsight, with some pretty profound post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mac, when he moved back to the U.S., uh, got married and moved to Muncie, Indiana with his wife and daughter and noticed immediately that in Muncie, he saw a lot of people that in his understanding of his training, he was supposed to see these people as his enemy, meaning that there was a Muslim community there. Seeing it as kind of a continued part of his mission from the military, he planned to make a bomb 
and to use it on a mosque in this community. He expected fully to get caught and what he saw in all of this was that this was an act of service to his country and those were the words that he was going to say when he eventually had to stand for what he had done. So he learned how to make explosives and he got ready to use them. He first went to the Islamic Center in Muncie in 2009 and people in uh, this Islamic Center could tell that he had something going on and someone just remembered asking him, can I help you? Pacing back and forth looked like he had a red face. Another person from the Islamic Center shares their memory of this first encounter. They said, my first impression of McKinney was that he seemed to be like a redneck. So it was somewhat scary in the beginning, but he came to the masjid and he, he's like a guest also. So I couldn't help except to hug him, to make him feel not artificially from my heart that he is welcome and he is a part of us. He sat there and he hugged McKinney's leg and he elaborates on this moment saying that this kind of greeting is important. He says, this is one of my duties. And you say, salam to somebody, in other words, peace, salam. What this means to tell this other person is that you are safe from me. There is no danger for me. Mac didn't know what to make of this hug from a stranger in such an intimate kind of way. And on top of that profound act, he said, these people were just plain old pleasant happy to be alive, happy to be in America, just happy and more than happy to talk to me. So Mac started going to the Islamic Center uh, regularly beyond that for prayers and dinners. And eight weeks later, he said to himself, I need to be a Muslim. Weeks after that, the FBI showed up at Mac's home looking for bombs and they Didn't find any, though they had been there. He had dismantled them and disposed of them. Mac went on then to serve as president of the Islamic Center in Muncie for two years. Now he tells his story on the road, traveling around the country, telling his story of going from hate to understanding, sharing that this group taught him what true humanity was all about. That's what it means to say that love hopes all things. Love imagines even the worst enemy you can imagine being transformed. In Mac's case, he was about to be the enemy, and he was transformed. A love that hopes all things is a love that God has. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. A love that hopes all things is willing to get close enough to realize the common humanity of those we've been conditioned to call our enemies. That's the kind of love that we, like Jonah, are appointed to embody. We are called to go to our own Ninevehs. We are called in love to hope that God is reliably, mercifully there. It's a hard task. So let's pray together. God, you can't make us willing, but you can help us as we seek to transform our minds and our hearts. Transform us so that we can learn the kind of love that hopes all things. Help us to mirror that steadfast love that you eagerly give to us for your sake and for ours. Amen. Let's join in singing.
number 582, My Love Colors Outside the Lines. A new one for us. I'm going to sing verse two and the refrain to help you get the tune in your ears. The tune's kind of hard to find in the accompaniment of the verse. And then I'll uh, ask us all to stand and we'll sing it verse two, verse one, verse two, verse three. It's easier to follow on the screen than in the hymnal, but you're sure welcome to use either either medium. <clears throat> My love colors outside the lines Exploring paths that few could ever find And takes me into places where I've never been before And opens doors to worlds outside the line We'll never walk in water if we're not prepared to drown Body and soul need a soaking from time to time And we'll never move the gravestones If we're not prepared to die And realize there are worlds outside the lines You got to hear verse one, but we'll do it all now
Our Father, we join with the psalmist to say that you are our God, our rock in whom we put our trust, our shield, the horn of our salvation, and our refuge. You are worthy of our praise. We thank you for this summer season of growth and the coming harvest, for gifts of fresh food and the refreshment of water. We thank you for the gift of work, for the expression of skills and competencies, for expressions that give meaning to our lives and make connections with and for others. We pray for those who seek work that meets their needs, for those who are unable to work because of disability or lack of opportunity, that you would strengthen them and encourage them and meet their need. We pray for those who are experiencing the loss of loved ones, the loss of health, the loss of homes through fire, the loss of hope itself in so many forms. Grant, O oh merciful healer, tender comfort and healing and the endurance to pass through the season of grief. Thank you for the seasons of celebration, of accomplishments, reunions, new opportunities, and new stages of relationships. Give us the grace to celebrate well and to praise you in the midst of it. We pray for the return to school for children and youth, for young adults, and for all whom support education in our schools and colleges. Thank you, O oh creative spirit, for the gift of our minds and the ability to learn. We pray for students that they would flourish in their work, that they would be challenged and interested in their learning. We pray for the negotiation of relationships with fellow students and teachers and employees during their days that you would give them wisdom for these interactions. And we pray for the openness to learning for all of us openness to learning to go deeper into our faith and into our discipleship. Keep us from stagnation, laziness, and apathy that we confess we are easily prone to allow. Source of energy and life, renew us and reignite us with fervor for you and your kingdom through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for those we love and who love us for the ways they bless and enrich our lives. We thank you for those we don't love, who are annoying, rude, and threatening. Thank you for the opportunities you give us to practice growing in love, 
moving us outside of our comfort zones to catch a glimpse of your magnificent grace and your infinite compassion. Jesus, be our helper. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As our offering is brought forward, we remember that all of life, our very breath, is a gift from God. In gratitude, we offer back to God a portion of what we have received. I'm going to ask you to pray with me now. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with good gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. We receive these gifts in gratitude and offer them to the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now we'll sing a bit more. We'll next sing Praise God, the doxology number 71. We'll sing verse A, and then we'll sing it in French at the very bottom of the page if you're using the hymnal. Please stand in body or spirit and remain standing for the following hymn as well. Number 828, there's a wild hope in the wind.
Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road and may God's blessing be with you always. Hold your spots just a moment. Holly has something to share. Hi. So you're welcome to celebrate together the beginning of school, whether that's homeschool for you or the beginning of a fall routine. Um, we do have ice cream back in the back along with the other treats. There is one um, dairy-free option. If you need that, please request it and we'll get that for you. Um, we're hoping that you will take a second, if you're someone who is no longer in school, to speak to those at your table about what their school experiences is like, is like, um, who their favorite teacher is, that kind of stuff. And if you're somebody who is in school and there's somebody who's not in school who is sitting by you, we would love for you to ask them what their schooling experience was like. And we hope you enjoy. Go in peace. <laughs> Thank you.